Hi folks, welcome back. This is the second in a three-part lecture series on research papers. In the first part, we covered how to find sources. Now we'll talk about how to evaluate the sources that you have found. And it comes back to ethos. Remember, ethos means credibility with a particular audience. Who are you writing for? What kind and how much evidence do they expect to see? How can you ensure the evidence you find is credible? Now, remember the concept of ethos changes depending on the type of audience you're dealing with. If you are writing a paper in a literature class, your professor will have certain expectations about the type of evidence uh, that's needed. Uh, you'll probably be quoting from the uh, short stories. You might cite a few uh, literary critics and so on. If you're writing a uh, for a science class, uh, your professor may expect you to uh, set up an experiment or the uh, same thing in a physics class. Uh, history class, politics, all these different classes will have uh, slightly different expectations about the type of evidence that you need to support your claims. Now, the basic uh, principle of a rhetoric of research is simply that some sources are more credible than others. There's no absolutely true source that you can just cite and everyone is going to believe it. Uh, there was a point in history, at least in America, when you probably could have gotten away with uh, citing a few biblical passages, and uh, that would have been the end of the matter. Uh, nowadays, though, you really have to do a lot of work uh, to find sources of all kinds of uh, varieties that will hopefully convince your audience. Now, here's some criteria that professors use to uh, determine whether or not the sources that you have cited are good sources. And then we'll, we'll you know, cover each one of these in turn, but just wanted you to see them all here. So the first one is relevance, and then we have accuracy, authority, context, timeliness, and scope. So the first, of course, is relevance. Uh, what sources does the informed reader need to see referenced in your work? Now, usually this isn't a hard thing to find, or it's, it's an easy criteria, a criterion, because whatever you type into the database, usually it automatically searches by relevance. So if you typed in, remember uh, in the first lecture, we typed in smoking policies on campus, and it showed us the most relevant essays or articles right away. Uh, but if for some reason that's not good enough, uh, you can also look at how often these sources are cited by other sources. Usually something that gets cited a lot is uh, very relevant because everyone else in that area has read it. Then you can also, of course, talk to your professors and say, you know, I'm doing a paper about smoking on campus. I was wondering if you could point me at some uh, really good sources for that. And you can, uh, they'll generally be happy to help. Okay, then we get to accuracy, which is the hardest one uh, for students because you don't know, you pro probably don't know at least, uh, the field well enough to know whether the uh, authors have done a good job in their research. You have to just sort of take a lot of this on, on faith or at least hope that um, someone else has fact-checked it and everything. But there are some basic things you can look for. You know, look at the type of evidence they provide for the claims. Uh, if they say, do they have, you know, more than one source to back up something? If you look at that source, is it uh, from another journal? Or perhaps they have, uh, you know, cited some biased study. Uh, there's, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the easy way I determine this. If you say, I have a great source about smoking, and uh, the source is from a tobacco company website, well, I'm a little bit skeptical of that. Um, what kind of sources does the source cite? I said, do they have a works cited list? Do they have a bibliography? If not, you probably want to move on. It's a little bit suspicious. And three, uh, the methodology. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the uh, coming up. Okay, so the authority, uh, chain of command, if you will, of uh, source types. The number one thing that you can cite is a peer-reviewed flagship journal article. So that is the creme de la creme of sources, especially if it's uh, really up to date. There's a few things that are going to be better than that as far as, uh, as, far as your professors are concerned. Uh, two, there are other kinds of journals. There's uh, Minnesota journals, for example, lots of you know, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Journal of Linguistics or Minnesota Journal of Rhetoric or whatever. Uh, so that's a little bit uh, less prestigious, right, because it's limited to one state. Um, same thing with uh, some universities have their own presses or their own journals and so on. Uh, so you're really getting down, uh, you know, further down. And eventually, you know, it's not a very credible source. So after the journals, uh, then you have scholarly books. And a monograph just means a scholarly book written by one person. Usually, though, a scholarly book will be uh, what's called an edited collection. So they'll have uh, 13 to 16 different articles in there, 
or chapters, and each one will be written by a different set of scholars. Uh, then government reports, uh, documents. Uh, there's a, I think it's USA.gov, lots of uh, government reports. Basically any website that ends in .gov uh, will have uh, fairly credible evidence as far as professors are concerned. And then we also have uh, theses and dissertations. Uh, you know, some of these are quite good, but again, if you if it's a choice between a thesis and a journal article or a scholarly book, I would always go with those earlier ones. Okay, so why is uh, what's this deal with the peer review process? It's it's worth uh, thinking about how the peer review process works and why we tend to trust things uh, that have been peer reviewed more. Now, here's how it works: the article or the author submits the article to the journal. The editor of that journal sends it out to review, usually to at least two different professionals or scholars in the field. Uh, those uh, reviewers will say, yes, great article, or, yeah, it sucks, or it needs some work. Uh, so the editor will then work with that author. I mean, if it gets rejected, it's out. Uh, but if, the, if they say it's okay, uh, then the editor and the author will work together to try to you know, make it as, as good as possible, fix the language and so on. And then finally it's published. And then I guess you could add another layer on top of that. Uh, other scholars respond to it in some way. So that's why these are considered more credible. You have all of these sort of checks and balances uh, to make sure that uh, incorrect information doesn't leak in. Now some scholarly books, or I guess uh, all scholarly books, are peer-reviewed but there's a couple of uh, limitations they have to deal with. Now, for one, it takes a lot longer to publish a book than a journal article. So this book, you know, by the time, you know, the author might have written this book two or three years ago, and it finally gets published, you know, there's a lot that can happen in between that. So usually the books won't have the most up-to-date information in them. You know this from your textbooks. You know, even though they come out with these textbooks every year, it seems like, uh, still they'll be uh, behind in some areas. And two, it costs so much more to publish a book than a journal that they have to appeal, they have to make sure it has a big audience. If there's only two or three people to be interested in this topic, they're not going to publish a book on it. But they might publish a journal article, even if there's only a couple other people in the world interested in the topic, because the, you know, the journal is highly specialized. They don't really have to sell. You know, they've got other articles to cover that one, right? <laughs> you know, everything doesn't depend on sales. Now, questionable sources, things you should never cite in a college paper. Uh, one, encyclopedias. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Encyclopedia Britannica, if it's Wikipedia, whatever. You don't want to cite that. Same thing with a textbook or any sort of uh, dictionaries or uh, reference works, because these are intended for everybody. These are not intended for professionals or for scholars or for uh, professors. Uh, these are just sort of general books. And the people that write an encyclopedia, they don't know, you know, they haven't done the research themselves, right? They're just citing, they're quoting, or they're uh, reading other people's research and presenting it for the general audience. So it's kind of been dumbed down, and you really don't want to uh, cite something that's been dumbed down. You want to cite the original source. Uh, magazines and newspapers, you know, same thing. Uh, magazines, you know, again, this is very high school research, you know, if you do... If you look at things like Time uh, magazine and quoting that, uh, the reporter for Time has probably talked to some scholars, perhaps, uh, talked to some uh, people that do real research, and those are the uh, places you could, should go uh, for citations. And sometimes uh, it's okay to cite newspapers and things if, you're, if you need them as primary research. So if I wanted to write, for example, a story about the St. Clouds or St. Cloud State uh, riots, SESU riots. Well, then I'll probably be citing some of the newspaper articles that came out at that time, but only as uh, primary sources. So we'll have to try to find some other sources that have, uh, you know, from the journals, uh, from the scholarly books, maybe find some stuff about campus politics, you know, things of that sort that I can uh, cite uh, that will be peer reviewed. Now, uh, you know, the worst sort of research you can do is just to go to Google and type in the topic and then just try to cite those lame uh, websites that pop up. You know, most of those websites will be, you know, they're, they're there, you know, who put them there? It could be some really biased group. You know, if I want to write an article about gun control and I go to the NRA uh, website to find sources, you know, I, I'd have to be an idiot not to realize those are biased. You know, of course, they're going to find studies that make uh, it look fine, 
uh, to have all the guns you want. You know, same thing with uh, uh, smoking. If I look at anti-smoking websites for my research, I'm only going to get very biased information. So <laughs> if I were you, I just would not even think about Google as far as doing my research essays. Okay, so authors. Now, in every field, there will be certain authors that stand out, uh, usually because they do really good work and they're highly respected. And if you're really respected, then a lot of other people will cite your stuff. So if you are reading in your textbooks, let's say, or you're reading other um, articles and journals, and the same names keep coming up again and again, maybe the same couple of books keep uh, getting mentioned over and over, that's a pretty good sign. You should probably uh, read those. If you don't, if you're brand new to the field, though, you can always talk to the professors in that field. You know, somebody could say, you know, Dr. Barton, uh, who are some influential compositionists? You know, and I could tell you uh, those and <laughs> save you a lot of time uh, than trying to figure this out on your own. So uh, don't be afraid to ask professors for help. Okay, so that's authors. Now we move on to publishers. Now, some publishers are more prestigious than others. Usually the best kind of book publisher for a scholarly book will be a university press. And you can tell it's a university press because it will have that in part of the name. So St. Cloud State University Press, uh, Minnesota University Press, or, you know, something like that. University of Chicago University Press. And sometimes they just put UP at the end. So those are usually not for profit. So, you know, that's a good sign there. It's a little less biased if they're not trying to uh, make money with it. Uh, so just keep an eye out for that. Uh, sometimes uh, commercial publishers get involved, uh, Sage, for example, and those books are fine. And then there's also <laughs> the Vanity Press, and those are the ones to stay away from because a Vanity, a vanity Press just means you, you know, anybody can have a book published. If I pay a Vanity Press enough money, they will publish my book. It'll look just like every other book on the shelf, so you can't just tell by the way that it looks, but you just, uh, you, you sort of probably already suspect if I had to actually pay someone to publish it, it's probably not as reliable or probably not as useful as a, you know, a book that a university press printed or a, a you know, commercial publisher printed. So, you know, just stay away from those vanity presses. Usually they will have a vanity press in the name, uh, but sometimes you have to look, maybe look, up, look for it online if you're not sure. All right, so this brings me to the methodology uh, part, and this is probably the most complicated to explain, but basically it's... Uh, you know, the different fields have different ways to do research. The scientific fields perform what's called empirical research, which basically means it has something to do with sensory data, uh, things that are out in the real world, right? So there's two kinds of uh, that. Uh, there's induct, I mean, there's a quantitative and qualitative. The quantitative has to do with numbers. So you've probably seen surveys uh, that say something like, uh, you know, rate the service of this restaurant from one to five, five being the best. So that gives the researchers some numbers to work with. Or you could imagine uh, maybe there's a psychologist studying rats in a maze. So they could time how long it takes the rats to get to the cheese. And then they would, uh, at the end, when they were finished with the experiment, they would have all these different uh, times, you know, numbers uh, they could work with. The qualitative has a bit more interpretation involved. So instead of looking for numbers, quantities, you're looking for qualities. So if I had a question that said, you know, please rank, or please describe rather, uh, your experience in this restaurant today in your own words. So people could write anything there, right? And those two people will probably write the exact same thing. So the researchers have to interpret that and decide, you know, is this more positive, is it more negative? Uh, maybe it doesn't fit either one of those categories. So there's a lot more interpretation involved. Now the second way, or the second method, is the rationalist approach, which is uh, instead of looking for answers out in the world, uh, we're looking for answers inside our own minds uh, using simple logic and, and reasoning. You know, in other words, deductive uh, logic. So, for example, if you want to talk about uh, Hamlet, instead of doing a survey or setting up some kind of a, a lab experiment, you just take a really hard look at the play, see if you can spot any patterns, and then just you know apply logic to try to defend your assertions. And then the third one here is the uh, most abstract, the social constructionist. Uh, so instead of looking out in the world or looking inside, we're looking at other people, uh, looking at language uh, for the truth. So you can think, uh, you know, one example I used to describe this is, you know, what is art? You know, what is art? 
how do you decide whether something's art or whether it's not? So a social constructionist would say, well, instead of looking at the actual, you know, Mona Lisa or, you know, famous sculptures or whatever, uh, you don't really need to look at those artifacts to know what, what, what art is. All you have to look at is the way uh, that certain people whose uh, opinions about art are respected and look at the, you know, ways that they talk about art. So, <clears throat> for example, one reason that we study Hamlet in college is that a lot of very notable uh, professors of literature talk about Hamlet and they really have a lot of respect for it. So it becomes an important piece of literature. It doesn't really matter ultimately if it's a good play or not. Uh, what matters is all of these people believe it to be a great play and they've talked about it and it's become an important part of you know what it means to be educated, what it means to be literate. So it's kind of a social constructionist approach. <clears throat> okay, that takes us to context. So you don't want to necessarily uh, mix and match different articles with different methodologies in them. Uh, again, if I'm writing this paper about Hamlet, and uh, let's say that there's some article from a psychology journal where they do sort of a, you know, I don't know, uh, you know they put students in MRIs, uh, machines, and uh, scan their brains when they're reading Hamlet. You know, maybe that's uh, part of a different conversation uh, than what the literature professor probably expects to see. So it's probably a good idea to, you know, if you're writing the paper for a literature class, you know, make sure all your articles are from literature journals. You know, same thing for a history class and psychology class and so on. You know, uh, psychologists uh, might talk about Hamlet. Uh, government uh, studies people might talk about it. Might be in a history, you know, all, all these people uh, talk about the same thing, but in different ways and for different reasons. Uh, timeliness. Now, usually it's better if the article is recent, but not necessarily. It depends, obviously. If you're writing uh, about smoking, you probably want recent articles because, you know what, they had totally different ideas about smoking back in the 1800s, let's say, or even in the early 1900s. I don't think they really started thinking smoking was a bad thing until the 50s and 60s, so you kind of want to keep an eye on that. <clears throat> on the other hand, if it's a literature class, and you're writing about Shakespeare, well, you know, probably some, there's probably some really great sources that are, are really old, maybe even, a, you know, written around the same time as uh, Shakespeare's plays, they would be fine. And so it just depends on the field. Now, scope is, is the, you know, how general or specific is the source? If it's a, maybe you are citing a book, but only one small chapter in that book has anything to do with your topic. So that means it's not a great of a source uh, than if the whole book was on the topic, right? Or the article dealt only with that topic. The trouble is if you, you know, if you had a book on the Civil War, let's say, just one book on the Civil War, you know, they, they're gonna have to be very general in that book, right? They're gonna have to gloss over lots of material. They're gonna have to leave a lot of stuff out to fit in the book. Um, on the other hand, if it's a 15 volume set on the Civil War, well, then they can put a lot more stuff in. So it's, you know, it makes a difference what the scope of the source is. All right, so I'll wrap up with some concluding uh, thoughts here. So how to find the best sources? One most obvious thing, talk to the professors. You know, professors all have office hours. Uh, you should be, hopefully, uh, you know, I guess it depends on the professor's temperament, but usually they'll have these office hours posted. You can just go in and, you know, say, I'm interested in researching Civil War and, uh, you know, <coughs> smoking in the Civil War. You know, who knows? Do you have any good sources you'd like to recommend? Or do you know any uh, authors I should look at? So that's a good place to start. Uh, two, ask a librarian. Uh, the librarians might not know about the specific professor. You know, maybe they do. But they'll definitely be able to point you in the right direction. And three, once you start to look at sources uh, that the, you know, the professor says, yes, you should read this article. Well, take a look at that article and see who gets cited in that article. Uh, chances are those are great sources, too. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, you can leave them on YouTube or on Canvas, and good luck with your research.